Welcome to Tea is for Triage on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Cheryl Spencer Morley. Cheryl brings a wealth of crisis management and knowledge to her position. Throughout her 25 years of public sector experience at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels, her strategic communications approaches have always revolved around providing proactive, authentic, and transparent communication. Now, she is no stranger to municipal issues and crisis management. For the last 10 years, her municipal senior leadership experience has included serving communities small and large in such roles as Director of Communications for Strathcona County, Director of Communications for the City of Edmonton, and Director of Communications for the former Mayor of Edmonton, Don Iverson, and the Chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus. She has decades of experience in building and implementing crisis management plans, and she has served as an issues and crisis spokesperson for federal, provincial, municipal governments. Some of the sensitive issues and crises she has dealt with include budget cuts, homelessness, opioid crisis, affordable housing, transit, the environment, employees being charged, code of conduct violations, racism, controversial council decisions, floods, wildfires, pandemics, infrastructure project delays, children dying in foster care, shootings, and bomb threats. So with that extensive background, we are so pleased to welcome Cheryl to the show. Cheryl, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to start off the line of questioning with my first question, then we're going to throw it over to Ian. And my first question to you is, how can municipalities proactively identify potential crisis situations that may require effective, and I use the word effective there, crisis management and communications? Very important. It's so critical that people can be proactive in planning ahead. And with that in mind, I think even thinking about the most remote chance of something happening, better to be prepared than not. So I'm a big advocate of even if you don't think in your municipality that something might happen, like you have an active shooter situation or maybe no chance of flooding because you have such great infrastructure in place, you should always be prepared no matter what. So for me, I think it's about thinking about not to be glim, but you should think about every possible disaster that could happen and every issue and work with your communication staff to be able to prepare templates for everything so that you can be ready to go and not be caught off guard so that you can start responding right away. All right, well, I'll jump in then too. I'm gonna take the flip side of that too and talk about in your experience, what sort of consequences have you seen for your the triage function, the communications function, not working well, uh, either in the short term or the long term, or, or both? Yeah, you bet. I think what happens sometimes is uh, people, I mean, pan- the pandemic definitely put a higher emphasis on the need to prepare, and that threw everybody off guard. So I have noticed an increase in interest in preparing more effectively for uh, these types of crises. But I think no matter what, um, people do not think something's going to happen and then it does and then nothing's prepared. So we know that social media is happening right away no matter what. You could be a parent that's out of school and you hear about something and you're posting it on social media before school can even respond. Or you're the student that's at the school. No matter what, community members are on social media and they are talking. So the longer it takes you to even acknowledge that an event is happening, you've already lost the opportunity to acknowledge that you're aware. And even if you don't have all of the information that you're able to acknowledge that you are aware that the search situation or you're trying to gather more information and that you'll be back in touch and tell people when you are. So I think when you don't, they feel like you're not being responsive and your reputation suffers as a result. And they don't necessarily expect you to have all of the answers, but they do want to know that somebody's on it because people get nervous whenever there's an issue or a crisis is happening. It's very natural for people to feel very nervous. And what do they do when they're nervous? They start to make up information or start to spread the rumor chain. And that's not healthy for anyone. So if we can stay on top of rumors as early as possible and say, these are the facts, this is what we know, this is what we don't know, and this is when we will know it, I think it really helps to keep people calm. Mm-hmm. Um, gonna, oh, can, go ahead, can I just I I, I I want to jump in on that for a second because being prepared and knowing how people are going to react are two different things are they not because you can prepare till you're blue in the face and for someone who's worked in the communications department in a municipality I know that you have to prepare for any scenario but 
you have to prepare that not everyone's going to be on social media. Not everyone's going to have access to social media. Not everyone's going to get their news from the radio station because they're not tuning in at the exact moment. So how do you triage the scenarios with the understanding that not everyone gets their communications the way that municipalities think they should? <laughs> you bet. The best thing is for people to be tuned into each of their communities and knowing where they are. So the most proactive thing municipalities can do is have really good data about how do people get their information. So if you have never had the chance to poll your residents to find out like, how do you stay connected? Do you, do you listen through the news? Do you have access to social media? Do you listen to it from your neighbor? Is it from um, Joe down the street who likes to talk at the Tim Hortons and, and, and he's the one that's having all the information? I think it's critical that you have as much of that as possible to know how to reach them all. So really knowing where your communication ambassadors are in the community and how to reach them quickly. And no matter what, you should prepare for social media and news media, no matter what. But in terms of what are the other forms, like we have the alert systems and being able to get people by phone and being able to get to them quickly, um, if they're registered in advance or being able to do some of the blanket emergency callouts, being able to reach everyone as quickly as possible in all the venues and let them know where they can go to for further information to encourage people to continue to go to that source, that's helpful, but being able to prepare in advance, knowing where everybody's pockets of information kind of comes from. Hmm. I'd like to circle back to just some things you had talked about before about how do you handle some of this triage function. You talked about confidence or portraying an air of confidence. How important is that confidence in a crisis, whether it's real confidence or whether it's performative conference, 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 confidence on behalf of any order of government or any organization you happen to be speaking for? Well, my experience has been is that the people can really smell when people are not telling the truth. And people prefer authentic communications. So I think if you're confident in what you're saying, but you're being also as transparent and honest as possible, that people will tell. I mean, mm -hmm. we've all been in the position where we've watched politicians uh, say things on TV or in social media, and we all judge them. We know it's a true fact. We judge them based on, hmm, I believe them or I don't believe them. But why is that? Is it because of your political views or is it because their answer doesn't sound authentic or is it because the people that they've surrounded themselves with with the facts don't feel like they're telling the truth people just really see it and that's why it's so important that in some of these scenarios matching some of that political with also some of the administrative side is really powerful at times so that as an example uh, the mayor of any municipality might deliver a message for the people and trying to at least acknowledge what's happening and be empathetic towards what's happening in the community. But the mayor shouldn't be expected to be the firefighter expert and the administrative expert with all the facts of things that are happening and get too overly involved. And this is a common issue that comes up in terms of which level of involvement mayor and council want to have versus uh, administration. So I think having the right people around you to have the right combination of authenticity from their perspective so that you can match both kind of the governance, but also uh, the administrative side and the facts side is key to being able to have the confidence level that people need. So how do you decide who who faces the media or whoever it is? If it you've mentioned the mayor, you've mentioned the fire chief or some subject matter expert or yourself, say, as a director of communications, who gets up there and when is that when is it appropriate to use each of those types of people? And maybe I've left something out, too. No, it's, it's my favorite question because this is where people trip up a lot. So I think the more you can work in advance to have some kind of understanding, whether it's your, at the municipal level or even the provincial level, federal level, wherever you are, but being able to have some understanding in advance of when this happens, who can speak to it first? Yeah. Um, and what if so-and-so is not available? And how are you preparing for that? I think it, it all depends on, are we at the beginning of a crisis? Are we during the crisis? Is it post-crisis? Which level? But no matter what, I mean, let's, let's use a municipality as an example. No matter what, there's political pressure. We know the mayor is going to have the pressure to respond immediately. Um, we would like to arm our mayor and council with all the same information, say, this is what you can say for now, but tell them that they go here for further information and then leave it to us. 
or if it's when something is first happening, you might send out a Cheryl to give the first news and then say, we're going to have a news conference with the mayor in one hour. But here's what I can tell you what we know for now so that then you can go and prepare the mayor and get them ready and then bring them out. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of on a case by case basis, but no matter what you should be preparing that there's a communication spokesperson ready to go no matter what. They are always your default. You need to be able to arm them with the right information so that they can get information out quickly that's accurate. And then being able to determine, okay, at this stage, is it a acknowledgement in the community of what's happening or is it more facts about the crisis itself? And so when I, like I mentioned earlier, when it's facts about the crisis itself, I think it's critical that it does come from the person that would be involved in getting the facts because it, it makes it more real. So like you say, fire chief, police chief, or second in command from, from that, or it could be the emergency operations center chief, it all depends. Um, but the one that is most armed with the most accurate facts that has the time and not trying to also deal with the immediacy of the safety and health of individuals. So that's always a critical piece too. You can't be having, there's been scenarios where fire chiefs are busy and they, when the firefighters are, are, are busy putting out the fires, you need to count on someone that you can say, great, here's the facts, go and have someone take care of it for you. There is no harm in that. Mm -hmm. People just want the facts and you want to say, I'm, they're busy right now. And this is the information I have for you. And when there's a quieter moment, we will bring out the fire chief and then kind of go from there. Uh, I, I, I have to ask the question, but I don't want to ask it in an inappropriate way, but I'm going to have to. Um, that's all good. But there are mayors, there are Reeves, there are councillors, there are elected officials, fire chiefs who are very type A personalities who want the control, who want to be the face of an issue. How important is it for you as a crisis manager, as a crisis communicator, to sort of check their privilege a little bit and say, it's great that you want to be the face, but you're not going to be able to know all the issues that are going to come up. And the firefighters who are on the grounds have a better understanding of what is on the ground than you who are in the ECO, EOC just dealing with the administrative side. Oh, it's very true. And we've <laughs> all worked with them. And I think part of it is just building that trust in advance. So how do you build trust with mayors and councils and the people around you? So whether there, you should always take an opportunity before a crisis is happening to give council an overview of how it should work in the communications world and why it should work that way and the importance of that. And I have found actually that councils are quite open to understanding, but they're very keen to get the information out and want to make sure that they're like the first to know and know what's happening. But if you build up that trust level in advance and saying, here's what my role is, here's what your role is, here's how we work together, here's how you can count on me and getting the information to you, and please don't post anything else. This is the risk when you do that, because that has happened in, in some cases across Canada, not, not naming any municipalities in particular, uh, but it happens, but there always needs to be that trust level built in advance so that they know that, okay, I trust I'm getting the right information and I'm sending it out and I trust that I can send this person out and it's not about me, but no matter what, every time there will be that political pressure. And so the mayor's job as the spokesperson for council and for the municipality um, does need to be very effectively prepared to be able to at least have the right messaging at the right level for them. So preparing in advance of this is the type of information that you'll get that you can say right away and having it ready to go is, is critical. If there's that difference in opinion, we'll say when we have our, our type A's in the room and, and we all know them, I think it's about talking to each other. I mean, it, there's a lot of panic around crisis at times. Um, there, there's heightened nerve levels. Um, there's pressures that people are seeing and, and other people that can't maybe not understand the other person's pressure. If you have good dialogue and you build good trust, you will find that right balance. It's those that don't work together enough in advance. So before the crisis ever happens, run your training exercises, talk about crisis communications, talk about who's gonna say what to whom and when, and let's have that conversation now so that we're not doing it on the day of when something happens.
Now, you, you've been talking from the perspective of someone who's worked provincially uh, with a larger municipality and with the, the, the capital of Alberta. But there are probably people listening to this right now who don't come from a large municipal administration, who have one or two people in their office and they're not a director of communications. What advice would you give to the smaller communities, the smaller rural communities, or even smaller villages and towns who may not have the budgets to have a director of communications or someone like yourself on the staff to provide this service and provide crisis management during a potential crisis? I would say call Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take anyone's phone call and help walk them through the steps. No, but in, in all reality, that is a passion of mine is, is how do we help each other and how do municipalities help each other? So even for the smaller shops coming together as a, as a family of municipal communicators in Alberta has been really critical. And if anyone's listening from those municipalities, I mean, we, we host conferences and part of it is talking about through some of those challenges, like, Hey, it's just me. I am party of one. How do I have access to this? What do I do? Where do I get backup? And the answer is each other. At any time, we should be able to call on each other as colleagues across Alberta and say, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Because when it comes to managing crisis, it's, it's all of our reputation and we have the ability to help one another. So I think it's getting your help set up early. So even if you are the shop of one or two, okay, who else could you go to that's either nearby and can get to you quickly or who can you have on speed dial that you could call right away? And I know I was half joking when I said call Cheryl, but I really do mean it. If someone really needed to, it'd be just call because the, the critical moments when you're freaking out when it's first happening to you can be very overwhelming. And you wanna be able to be ready for that and know how to proceed from there and help set up a good plan. But I think knowing who can you count on around you, um, who might you call in and having those established relationships in advance Will be very helpful because in the communications family we all feel each other's pain and we want to help each other so where we can i know that anyone across alberta would help another colleague out and across canada as well so speaking of things like like building skill or knowing what the heck's going on is there training or books or courses that individuals members of council or not maybe not members of council but members of administrations might be able to take to learn how to do some of this stuff well the traditional method has been of course the incident command system training uh ics for short is what they call it what i find and it's not to, to slight the system but it's very much like it's based on a lot of like fire and police type situations and, and it's built in that in that command structure. Um, but the ICS training is very critical to take in every municipality to be able to know, okay, how will the governance work when it comes to decision making and the who's communicating what to whom and who's making those decisions and the planning in advance. So that would be number one. If you've never heard of ICS, I would say go there first and make sure you take that and take as many levels as you possibly can because you will never regret taking them. I just think what's lacking right now across the country is what are some of the courses we could be collectively doing together in terms of, okay, actually going through real scenarios and doing some more training across Canada to help each other out and say, okay, well, what if this happened and what if this happened? And there's, there's way less of those. I know, um, Ian and I have chatted about, geez, that would be something great to be able to, to put together for folks as well and being able to run uh, municipalities through it as well. And I think it's important to run the mayor and council, not just through the exercise of this is your governance role, but actually running them through an exercise of if this happened, what would you be saying on social media? And let's have you play the role of spokesperson and being able to do that. So no matter what, being able to do that. So I mean, like I said, I'm always happy to help. And if people reach out, there's always a way that you can do that training for municipalities to cater it. But I think it's critical that you just keep practicing at that local level. Mm. At the, early on during your introduction, Chris talked about some of the experience you've had dealing with various different crises and how you triage those. Do you manage or handle, I'm not sure handle is the right word. How do you respond to a, a local crisis versus a regional one? Say something that's got to do with climate, like uh, forest fires and things like that versus you use the 
term about active shooters, which might be a more local one. Is there a different way of dealing with it when it's not just a single municipality that's, in, that's involved? Yes. So when it came to COVID as an example, we sure. knew pretty early on that this isn't just about us, but we should really be coming together as a region in terms of our approaches. So true fact, right at the beginning of, of COVID and when everything was happening, there was a group of, of communicators. We were reaching out to each other and trying to send our stuff where we could and say, this is what we're saying about it. What are you saying about it? What do you have? And again, um, like some regional uh, municipalities don't have the resources. So if someone does have the resources, in the case of whether it was the city of Edmonton or Strathcona County, we shared stuff with other um, municipalities and said, here, you can use any of this if you'd like. Here's, here's a poster, here's some social posts, here's this, here's that, but whichever way that you can kind of come together as a region if something's affecting you all. And also just really talking with each other when something is happening, maybe there are different approaches happening across the region and how are you gonna deal with that? Because we noticed a few times during the COVID pandemic, it would be, well, this municipality is, stopping with this and this one isn't and this one's calling a state of local emergency and this one isn't and understanding what each other is actually saying is going to also predict what types of questions you're going to get from the media so staying sure. regularly in touch with your regional either communicators or even as a CAO um, as regional CAOs finding the time to do that is really important so I think being able to know how you can help each other out if it's something that's going to go across the region or with the recent wildfires um, in Strathcona County. I mean, I know I called my old contacts in the city of Edmonton and said, hey, this is what we're doing. And this is how we have our reception center. Edmonton was a huge reception center, but we were also still getting calls in Strathcona County because we were one of the only ones that actually had a phone number available for people to call. We were getting calls from all over the place. And so keeping in touch with the people that are managing the communications in each of the municipalities is quite critical. So mm -hmm. basically how you can help each other out is helpful and watching stuff grow uh, together. So sometimes it might start local and then it's starting to go more regional and being able to stay on top of that. Um, and then also being able to know each other in advance. That's why again, relationships are critical. Know each other in advance, get together, whether it's coffee, wine, whatever your choice. But I think the more relationships you can build in advance, it makes it a lot easier to reach out to each other, to help each other out. You just spoke about wildfires. And I want to stick on that for a bit because we are based in Alberta. All three of us are here in Alberta. And this summer we saw uh, wildfires uh, force the evacuation of a few municipalities across Alberta and then even Northwest Territories having to evacuate. Um most crisis communication starts locally and then the province will come in and sort of take over the reins of what needs to be put out and then they have their own sort of venues to put information out for themselves but from a citizen's perspective they're looking looking for local information they're looking for what's happening on the ground locally while it's great to have all those resources of connecting with fellow communicate communicators from across the province how does a crisis communication person a staff member and a director of communication work with a province who wants their information out while trying to balance the needs and wants of your residents because they want what they want and they don't want to hear what the premier is saying or what's going on in Edmonton. They want to know what's happening locally. How do you balance that sort of tug of war? Well, again, I go back to relationships. So you know, I'm a person who's not shy to pick up the phone and call. So I've never shied away from calling my provincial colleagues and saying, just so you know, this is something that's really important that we have to do right now and have that courtesy to be able to say, we're going to have to get this out at this time. And we know that you are going to do this or maybe at a later time and be sharing the information in terms of this is what's important. Having respect for one another is, is pretty critical in these situations. I think that sometimes that's where the communication breaks down between the different levels of government. And so the more that you can speak with one another as equals. You need to speak to one another as equals. The one level of government isn't better than another level of government. We're all in this together. And the more that we can say, okay, I understand your pressures. I mean, you might not want to be planning a news conference at the same time that the premier is having their news conference as an example versus when you plan yours, but it doesn't mean that yours shouldn't happen. So trying to find that right balance of respect in terms of 
planning and logistics about when they're planning to time their communications? Is there new information? I mean, during the pandemic, we were all glued as communicators to what's happening during the updates. What can we get out right now, right after this? What are we posting on social media? And I think we came together even more as a regional municipality group of communicators uh, to keep each other informed because we all also had to manage other things that were going on in our municipalities as well. Like this is what happened at the news conference. Great. Here's what's coming out. Hey, did you know that so-and-so is having a news conference at this hour and keeping in touch? So I think the more that you can also speak to the province about timing and again, talking it out, the better it is. I want to, I'm going to ask a very tough question here because oh. as the communications director, you have a pulse on what's going on on social media. You have a pulse on what's going on around your region because you're seeing it in real time. You're seeing the sort of reaction. Now, you from time to time will have to go to your CAO, your mayor, and say, there's going to be a crisis and this is going to be what it is. Sometimes they will not listen to you because they will say, oh, it's just a non-issue. I, I take the wildfires in Slave Lake from firsthand experience here. Um, there was a large swath of post-traumatic stress from those fires. Every fire season, there would be constant requests from the public asking for communications around what was going on, where the fires were. If they saw smoke, you would have to try to lower the tensions. How do you sort of ensure that what you're communicating is correct, but doesn't go into a full-blown crisis where the mayor or the CAO saying you have just exacerbated the issue and it could have just been an easy post. I think this is when it comes down to agreeing to some principles of, of communication in terms of um, what's more important and being able to get to that very quickly in advance. And like I said, about training in advance and discussing in advance. Okay. So if there is this type of scenario happening, how about no matter what, we're able to communicate at least this about this topic right now. And then I, th I think no matter what, people are hungry for information and people sometimes say, oh, that might be exacerbating an issue because they're afraid about, oh, that's going to cause us to have to respond even more. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what communicating is. Yes. When you put something out, you must respond. So I think it's, I think personally, the, the, the answer is always better to put something out that you know is at least factual, make sure it's factual and you can't go wrong. If you're not sure of the facts, then make sure you only speak to the piece that for sure is a confirmed fact and then being able to kind of go from there. I'll, uh, I'll throw it into the mix politics, into the mix a little bit too. You've made several references to it. Have you ever run into a case where politics has come into play in how we, whatever organization responds to, to a crisis and kind of how do you deal with that, with that if it does happen? I think politics always comes into play because it's politics. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I'll use an example of, when uh, Fort McMurray had to be evacuated and the city of Edmonton was a host reception center, I don't think anyone was totally prepared for something of that nature and what was going to happen in terms of all the levels of government suddenly getting involved politically. We had the you know, ministers, the prime minister, you've got the premier calling, and we're not even the municipality that was getting evacuated. We're just I mean, the host center for the people that had been evacuated and the pressures. So being able to put someone on the handle the political pressures is a pretty key role. So in that case, um, I played that role in terms of trying to at least communicate between anyone that was trying to contact from the different political levels and trying to keep them all with the same information. It's it's big things to juggle when it comes to everybody wants to say something about a crisis and they need that politically to be able to say what they're doing about it. But how do you balance that effectively? But politics, no matter what, it always comes into play. I haven't seen one major crisis that's happened, whether it's wildfire or the pandemic where politics has not been at play. But I think if you, again, going back to kind of that respecting each other's levels, um, but also where everyone's kind of coming from, 
sometimes the federal government and the provincial government may not have the same understanding of the municipal pressures and have a particular plan in mind. And they need to be able to talk that through with the municipality to be able to find a way to make sure is that actually doable and what's actually going to be helpful because everyone ends up wanting to help and, and say something and do something. But sometimes we're not ready yet and we just need to get through the initial phase before we can even tell them that. I have a final question for you, Cheryl. It's, we've talked a little bit about where we've been and where we are. I'd like to look forward just a bit. Do you see anything on the horizon about changes that might be coming or things that you would like to see different in the realm of either triage or like crisis management and crisis communications? In a perfect world, where would we be headed? I think we are going to see more and more climate crisis. I, I don't think this should be a shock. I know people have varying views on the environment and, and climate, but I don't think that... Uh, people are doing enough to prepare effectively for that. And whether that's not just from the communications exercise on if we had a flood or we had a fire, how could we be ready? But that there's just going to be more of it throughout mm -hmm. the world. So how can we better prepare for that and be able to have the right training and everything ready to go? Um, and even like we say, even when you do have everything ready to go, some of the responses need to evolve as they're happening. So you can be pretty ready on paper and then suddenly something happens and you're like, oh, well, that didn't work. And now we're having to evolve and change change of plans. Mm -hmm. So I think just being able to anticipate, but I think definitely not, not getting away from any of the climate crisis and especially with the current state of infrastructures across Canada and various municipalities. Um, it's again, not being glim, but just, people needing to stay on top of their infrastructure needs in their municipalities because of the critical role that it plays in, uh, in helping prevent further crisis and being able to look at everything um, that a municipality is doing to try and reduce potential crisis in their community. People don't always like to spend the money up front to be able to prepare adequately. We know those, those pressures, the balance in budgets, et cetera, but I think we need to look at climate crisis environment and being able to look at how we can best prepare ourselves for that. No matter what we also have, the other one is people haven't stopped being angry. It feels like we're in the state where everybody's a bit angry at each other. And I think we need to be more empathetic towards one another. Everybody can have different views, but there's been a certain loss of like empathy and respect for one another. And that is probably one of the biggest crises that we face across Canada. We do not have enough empathy for one another and people are approaching things with anger and, and bitterness and you see the fights on social media and you see the divisiveness. But I think if we go back to being more empathetic to one another, like anger is one of our biggest crises in Canada is the other. And I know that takes a lot to combat and maybe if everybody had access to, to free therapy, it would help everyone. Um, but it's no joke because just like Chris said earlier, I mean, there's, there's PTSD and it happens all the time, but the more adequately prepared people can be for crisis, which also includes taking care of your mental health, the better off we will be. So people should invest in mental health and making sure that we all understand our triggers so that we don't respond in an angry way that we still respond in, in the way that we can be kind of objective, but still have an opinion. Thanks. You, you just openly talked about being prepared. Being prepared is great, but there's a lot of people starting at square one. There's a lot of municipalities who have not even thought about this issue because they're thinking it's not going to happen here. We're not worried. What advice, what's the first step that municipalities need to undertake to ensure that they do have an adequate, proper crisis management, crisis communication policy policy? bylaw in place so that if that eventual crisis does happen, they are prepared than they were at the end of 2023. I think that in the past, the idea of a municipal emergency management plan, people were like, oh, that's a great document. It says we're going to do these things and more work needs to go into them in being able to uh, take it as probably one of the most serious documents in a municipality, being able to look at your emergency response plans, not, not from fire response or police response, but how are you going to be responding in certain cases of all types of emergencies 
and being able to document what your processes will be and how you choose to manage that based on the size of your municipality and who's going to be selected as a spokesperson and how you're going to interact with one another is absolutely critical. So start with those plans and then looking at your, if it does help with your communications policies, if you did want to look at your communications policies that said, okay, this is our regular policy, but in the case of an emergency, we then switch to this and being able to have in advance some, some discussion about that, I think is very helpful because like I said, everyone's keen to get information out, but that's how also misinformation gets out as well. So if you can have some kind of balance between when does it switch over from the regular things we do to no, when this happens, it has to go this way only. <laughs> Gerald, uh, I want to thank, take a moment and thank you from both Ian and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk to us about crisis communication and crisis management. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, My Charles. pleasure.